the topic is here. So, this is a this is something we have been discussing uh, these last three days is a, as a major uh, hindering factor for regional uh, integration and, um, and also um, low level of intra-regional trade. Um, well, it is, um, we know that when we compare uh, when we uh, when is uh, uh, when you compare sub regions in asia uh, south asia is uh, is is coming to the top of the uh, list as a region a sub region which has uh, higher um, barriers uh, not only well tariff as well as uh, non tariff barriers um, and uh, and also um, well, the, the, there are a number of reasons and uh, uh, then um, one, one thing is that that, that leads to um, in lower intra-regional trade and the other factor is low level of uh, trade facilitation, which is also uh, the progress in uh, facilitating trade is also uh, lower uh, or slower than the rest of the regions. Now, as a result, what is happening is that uh, uh, trade cost uh, for uh, trade is basically very high. Now, some, some of the examples is that like Southeast Asian countries or uh, East Asia, for example, are taking say uh, 15 days to complete a trade transaction. Uh, we, well, South Asia is taking 30 days roughly. So, it is a double of that. And then to moving a container from um, basically uh, from the factory to port. Um, uh, so, it cost as uh, South uh, East, Asia, East Asia is about 800 dollars and it is here 1600 which is the double of that. Now, we have in fact, uh, SCAP has developed a, a trade cost database um, and then we recently launched with World Bank and uh, that gives you um, uh, all the data, bilateral trade cost data. I think it is a very interesting database for researchers and for policymakers to see how we are doing. Now, uh, so we need to find, we like to see greater inter-regional trade. To have greater intra-regional trade, we need to have a greater integration and then there are barriers. So, now we need to find some uh, innovative solutions to um, reduce these barriers and, and to have a high, greater integration um, and then uh, benefit from this globalization and integration not only intra within the region, but also we need to connect with of course. Um, other regions, but here since we are t talking about um, lower intra-regional trade, like uh, the number people say it is about 5 percent to 10 percent, so which is, which is very small uh, compared with the uh, other, other sub-regions. Now what we, uh, what we are going to do is that uh, of course these things have been, uh, we, we, have, we have been discussing them, the different panels and uh, the plenary and all these places. So, we I think we need to go a little bit deeper into these issues in, in this particular uh, session. Uh, so, we, we, uh, we are very uh, fortunate to have very um, experienced and knowledgeable panel of experts. Let me introduce very briefly um, the, our panelists and then we will go to the discussion. Uh, first, we have Dr. Nisha Tanija, uh, professor and project in project in charge, Indian Council for Research on International Economic Relations, New Delhi. And then we have Dr. Salim Rahan, associate professor, University of Dhaka, Bangladesh. And then uh, Dr. Prabhid Da, uh, fellow RIS, New Delhi, uh, India, on, on that side. And then we have Mr. Uh, Khalid Mahamud. Uh, Founder, Director, Wellcott Sourcing Pakistan, Professor Indana, uh, Indranath Mukherjee, Senior Consultant RIS uh, India. And then we have Dr. Ram um, uh, Saran Mahat, Senior Leader of uh, Nepal uh, Congress. 
did we miss anybody? No, we got everybody, right? Yes. <laughs> so, we have six uh, panelists and um, so we, we know the issues uh, at, at the table. So, we will, um, we need to look at, well, of course, tariff and non-tariff barriers and trade facilitation and how uh, the, the reducing these barriers and improving trade facilitation so that we have a greater intra-regional trade and, and uh, integration. So, that is the whole purpose. We want to come up with some practical solutions, practical um, ideas. Uh, you, we are coming from this, uh, of course, plenary. We heard when some of the, I think, private sector people said. So, I think we need to listen to uh, what they are saying. Okay, shall we start with uh, uh, Indranath um, and uh, with, uh, with the, the first issue, the tariff and uh, um, what is your view on South Asia's progress in uh, reducing tariff um, and uh, that can happen in unilaterally as well as through various agreements. We just want to get a, a starting point there. Uh, just, just before that, I, I just, yes, that is a good idea. That, well, I am thinking for the panelists to give at least uh, two times if possible and then we have uh, some interactive discussion also. Can you make it like uh, seven minute max, and then we will have another, you know, uh, uh, opportunity? <coughs> yes. Uh, uh, the concern of the present day is really with tariff barriers. Mm. You see, the RTAs are flourishing, particularly in South Asia, but they are emphasizing to start with on tariff barriers. So we need to start with that in our discussion. Since 2000s, beginning of this decade. The uh, MFN rates have come down for South Asia as a whole from 19 percent to around 12 percent. Nevertheless, this region is still characterized, as you have mentioned, as one of the least restricted, restrictive, most rest and least integrated globally. Owing to the operation of SAFTA and in particular the bilateral FTAs, the preferential rates have come down considerably. However, for countries not engaging in bilateral FTAs, such as India and Pakistan, the wedge between MFN and preferential rates remain wide. The large number of products under sensitive <coughs> list, particularly agricultural products of softer contracting states, as also the substantially high tariffs on agricultural products relative to non-agriculture would also keep the differential between the MFN and the preferential rates quite wide. Regional trade liberalization initiated under a positive list approach and uh, uh, identified about 700 odd products under four rounds of protracted negotiations under SAFTA, uh -huh. which was the beginning of SAFTA. India liberalized half of these products. The concessions were mainly directed in favor of LDCs. The margin of preference offered under these rounds were modest, not exceeding 25%. The exception was India, which offered 50 to 100 percent margin of preference for LDCs. The offers appeared to be a number of games, a game of numbers, as the trade coverage was minimal, and except for a few products, the coverage was not substantial. It has been well researched that the impact has been modest. Noting the slow progress under SAFTA, SAFTA took off in 2006. True to the spirit of FTA, it set a time plan for phasing out the duties in the two phases, with LDCs given a longer time to phase out the duties and to come up to 0 to 5 percent. And as the calendar shows, the process will be over by 2018 for all the countries, including the LDCs. I will not go into the details. However, the caveat underlying the phase out was the long list of sensitive list each country put up with a view to protecting their vulnerable sectors. The process of pruning this list is on. Under phase two, the working group has been set out to undertake the pruning. And it has been pruned down fr f substantially from uh, by about 20 percent already. And it, the process is ongoing. In a remarkable spirit of opening out its market for LDCs, India drastically brought down its sensitive list for LDCs 
from earlier 480 products to 25 non-merit products such as tobacco and liquor. Maldives too brought down its sensitive list from 681 to 154. Another broader approach, a regional trade agreement in, is APTA, in which India, Bangladesh and Sri Lanka are members. Uh, the number of products offered concessions after the third round in 2006 was around 5,500 for LDCs with a margin of preference of around 27 percent, 59 percent for LDCs. The fourth round aimed at broadening its scope still remains to be undertaken. As compared to regional initiatives, the bilateral approach seems to have worked more effectively. To illustrate, Indo-Lanka Free Trade Agreement and India Sri Lanka Pakistan Free Trade Agreement have already phased out their duties burning the sensitive lists that have lower coverage in terms of products. Items are lower than in the SAFTA process. In August 2008, India allowed duty free import of 206 garment items duty free for Sri Lanka. Further, in September 2012, India permitted duty free government imports, garment imports up to 8 million pieces waiving any linkage of sourcing of fabrics uh, in this transaction. Additionally, India has notified duty concessions for non-LDCs under SAFTA, which would bring down the duty five to 5% 5 against 11% right now. With Bangladesh, in April 2001, India decided to increase duty-free import duty to 10 million pieces and dispensed with countervailing duty on all jute products. Further, India announced duty-free, quota-free access to 46 textile tariff lim uh, items on September 2011 after India's Prime Minister's visit to that country. With Nepal and Bhutan, India already has a duty-free regime. Now, what has been the impact? Um, the impact can be felt in terms of numbers. Uh, it has been a growth in the trade, in the um, duty-free items and also there has been diversification. Mm. To take the case of Bangladesh, the import of garments under section 62 clothing knitted increased to 52 million dollars from 33 in one year and in uh, HS 63 non-knitted items from 17 percent to 20 percent in one year. Around that means around and this amounts to about 20 to 25 percent of India's global imports. Mm. So India is vacating this space for Bangladesh to fill up. And India also is perhaps vacating its own space with a lot of cost to the manufacturers of garments in India who are complaining about the cheap imports. This has been done at a cost. And India is rightfully vacating. And it should move to a higher level of manufacturing. That's the idea. In Sri Lanka, the growth diversification and have also been there in textiles, particularly in uh, uh, in uh, HS62, the growth in textile imports has been substantial. Uh, the diversification part of it shows that products like electrical machinery, ships and boats and furniture, they have increased tremendously. In fact, they account for substantial part of Sri Lanka imports, the, in spite of the fact that vegetable oil and copper are no longer in the trading list. In spite of that, these new products have come up in place of the old ones, vacated by the old ones. Um, with Pakistan, bilateral exchanges have taken place, normalization process, lot of talks have been going on, and uh, uh, Nisha will be dealing with it. Uh, unfortunately, there has been stop in that arrangement, but if that happens, then SAFTA will get another boost in the arm. Now, what, are, what should be, what are the limitations of these agreements, I think I'll reflect just broadly. The first need is that it should be made entirely duty free. Why keep it to 0 to 5 percent? It should be made duty free as in case of bilateral agreements. Secondly, the broaden this coverage, coverage mm -hmm. of the things will be broadened and that will come up for discussion about non-tariff barriers. If an effort to be made to prune the sensitive list, particularly on agricultural products. And finally, Pakistan not to renege on its commitments to move towards normalization. That would help. Okay. So, give it.
thank you i think it is a very good uh, starting point with uh, we well south asia had made some progress but a uh, lot to uh, we have to do a lot to come to uh, the target that we want uh, well you have already given some of the reasons for why it is not uh, moving uh, uh, at a speed that we would like to say now um, before we um, of course, let us put the issues on, on, on the table. Can we move on to maybe uh, non-tariff barrier side and then can I, uh, um, can I get uh, Selim to uh, uh, comment on, um, on the NTBs? We know that uh, NTBs are, in fact, when you take total trade cost, um, this is going to be the major portion. It is tariff on just 10 percent according to various data sources. And the rest is NTBs, which is traditional NTBs as well as all other trade procedures and, and uh, trade documentation, either basically from, uh, from the factory to the harbor and uh, various stages, there are various barriers. So that, that is what uh, we are dealing with. Now, um, now uh, uh, Salim, what, what do you think, we, we, um, where are we here, are we doing well, in this uh, area, especially um, this is a problem for regional integration, and I know you have done a lot of work on this uh, regional integration side also. Uh, your comment, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, actually, I uh, would start by saying that uh, in South Asia, when you talk about regional integration, the dividend you get from reduction tariff is, is gradually now vanishing. Actually, mm. you don't really, uh, in the coming years, you don't, you don't really get much from reduction tariff. So the major focus is now coming from, uh, should be on the non-tariff issues. And of course, I fully agree with you. The non-tariff issue is the thing, you know, or non-tariff barriers, if you put it in the other way. Uh, these are the things which will, uh, and of course, trade facilitation. Probit is master on that, so he can talk on this. Mm. Uh, just to uh, uh, highlight one important point that, actually, I think we have some wrong notion about South Asian countries, in the sense, that when you talk about export capacity, I think uh, uh, the idea is that the South Asian countries, they don't have much export capacity. Because and they, are, they export only to, mostly to the countries outside of this region. In a very recent study, what I have tried to show, at a, using a very six-digit HS code level, that actually even Afghanistan has got some significant export capacity, but not being exported to uh, this region. Bhutan as well, and I have actually for eight South Asian countries, when it comes to bilateral trade with India, I've identified a lot of products actually where you have large export capacity or probably full export capacity, but actual export is zero. So uh, in that context, in that context, uh, I tried to just give you a brief, just very uh, snapshot of actually where the NTMs are there because. Uh, at this study, we couldn't really identify whether the NTMs are the major reasons for this low export or uh, zero export. Just to tell you, between Afghanistan and India, uh, Afghanistan, the top 50 products where Afghanistan has full export capacity, but export to India is zero. Uh, uh, out of this 50 products, 42 items has NTMs in India. Uh, and if similarly, from India to Afghanistan, out of the 50, uh, top 50, actually, interestingly, 11 items has NTMs in Afghanistan. Uh, between Bangladesh and India, when Bangladesh want to export to India, top 50 products where Bangladesh has full export capacity, but zero export to India, 49 products has NTMs in India. So actually what we did in this study, we tried to uh, use the UNCTAR's very latest NTM classification and try to code those NTMs, you know, for different persons at the six-digit level. Excuse me, what is NTS? NTM. 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 Non-tariff non measures. measures. Non because we are talking about non-tariff barriers. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, actually, when non-tariff measures, <laughs> it can turn into a non-tariff barrier. Easily. So, yeah, easily. easily. Yeah. It can <laughs> turn okay. uh, probably according to the WTO, you know, non-tariff measures are sort of you know accepted. No, you don't. You don't. You shouldn't. Uh, no. But when it turns into sort of prohibitive, then it can be a non-tariff barrier. Mm. So just you know, I can talk mo more on this, but to give you that, uh, under the top 50 products, we could see that the major products are under non-tariff measures. So I think we need to do something and how to handle these things. Actually in that study tried to, uh, uh, the suggestion I tried to came up with that you need to have sort of transparency in those non-tariff measures or non-tariff barriers. 
uh, some sort of transparency, some terms of documentation, and then definitely action. Whatever action you, you can undertake at the regional level, at the national level. And then the, I think the most important <coughs> thing is the monitoring. Whether there would be, have been some progress in those non-tariff measures, in the reduction in non-tariff measures or non-tariff barriers. Now, I think uh, my understanding of this regional integration in South Asia is that uh, uh, I don't know whether uh, many of you would, 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 would agree with me that uh, the, the way the, the, or the route to the deeper integration or you know, more integration in South Asia, probably it would take a bit different way than it happened in other regions in the world. Uh, definitely, there are cases for moving from FTA to Customs Union or Customs Union to more higher forms of integration in terms of more these are in terms of reduction tariffs. But actually, in South Asia, probably the way this region could gain more, and I think the natural tendency is to move towards, mm -hmm. is to uh, deal with the other forms of non tariff issues like you know, services integration, investment integration, and investment or, or working on trade facilitation issues. So I'd really like to have your ideas, or you know, actually my ideas is that, you know, probably South Asia. When we talk about deeper integration, yeah. the roots are, you know, the you know the ways are deeply rooted in deeper integration in services, in investment, and, act, and of course, uh, you know, trade facilitation. And in that case, I don't see much role, and I, I think the roles of the, the institutions at the <coughs> regional and the national level, uh, and still, I think you know, we need to you know define what roles these institutions can. Uh, have. Uh, just to say uh, the, at the end that uh, I think the whole process of regional integration in South Asia is not being linked to the growth process of the individual countries. It's sort of delinked. The way the countries are growing in South Asia, the regional integration, integration is not really being factored in. So you can see that probably in South Asia, the way these countries are growing, they are not being benefiting from, benefited from each other's uh, you know, growth. So I think this is something where we need to, you know, take into consideration. And uh, finally, uh, I think, uh, uh, as I said, that uh, a bit of innovative uh, ideas should come forward. Uh, definitely, there would always be a sort of traditional route to regional integration. But I think there is a time now to look whole, this whole thing in a more innovative way. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Salim, for that. Uh, uh, remarks. Uh, in fact, um, well, it is we should go for deeper integration in uh, in services, investment, as well as uh, trade facilitation, and that will help uh, reducing uh, this NTBs and and also enhance trade uh, regional integration. Now, one other thing which is very rela uh, very much uh, closely related to South Asia's regional uh, integration is. The, the issue of Pakistan and India, the, which is well known, right? We, we can talk about it openly. And um, well, you know, some uh, political stability for any, any uh, integration is very important. In that uh, respect, <coughs> I think most positive thing happened over the last, I think, couple of decades or so, so that this uh, normalization of trade between pa Pakistan and uh, India. So, uh, can I come to Nisha to um, uh, take us through uh, whether the, this uh, normalization of trade between India and Pakistan, what kind of impact it will have and especially stimulating trade uh, within the region and also SARC process, SAPTA process to move forward. Nisha, please. Thank you. I was so happy when you said <coughs> that uh, the normalization process that has been on for the last two decades. Because people usually say, oh, since November 2011, the trade normalization has happened, which is not true. And not very many people refer to it as a two decade long uh, process that has actually made a big bang impact mm. in November uh, 2011, which is when Pakistan announced that they would give MFN status to uh, India. To India. Mm. And the way it stands right now is that Pakistan has uh, moved from a positive list to a negative list. So right now they have a positive list and they have a negative list of uh, 1,209 items. And they have a SAFTA list which is under SAFTA. And uh, India has, a, uh, India has uh, always given MFN status to Pakistan. Uh, and uh, we, have a we have a sensitive list which is operational under SAFTA. 
uh, whatever concessions India is giving is actually under SAFTA. And if we look at it within the SAFTA framework, then uh, India has an FTA with uh, uh, bilateral FTA with all the L, uh, um, with all the it, uh, with uh, Nepal, with Bhutan, with Sri Lanka. And amongst the there are three non-LDCs in the region, which is Sri Lanka, Pakistan, and uh, India. And India has an FTA with Sri Lanka. So the only other NLDC that there is in uh, the region is Pakistan. So whatever concessions India is giving to uh, the NLDCs effectively are being given to Pakistan. So even though it looks like the negotiations are ongoing in the SAFTA framework, actually it is a bilateral negotiation between the two countries. Um, now, uh, if you look at the banned list or the negative list of 1209 items, then the major item in that is basically automobiles. And uh, within that, I, I, th I think it is very important to uh, have informed research so that the lobbies that we, are we were talking about in the morning, they are informed about what it means, what this banning means and whether it is actually detrimental to these sectors or not. So that kind of informed research is needed for them. And uh, we looked at the automobile sector and what we found was that out of 167 items, there were only 35 which we termed as vulnerable, which meant that these are the 35 items in which India is competitive but Pakistan is not which means that the RCA is less than 1 in Pakistan for these items and in uh, India it is greater than 1. So if there are only 35 items then the remaining really do not matter. And then we also looked at what this, what <coughs> these items mean, these 35 items mean if we look at uh, Pakistan's uh, imports from uh, the rest of the world and we found that even though they have a FTA with China, I think from China they import about 12 percent, from Japan they import about 14 percent of these 35 items and the remaining is actually coming, a large chunk is coming from Japan. So clearly the cost advantage would be a lot more if, if the private sector had to import these items from India rather than from Japan. So this kind of, uh, even putting it across simply to the private sector can have an impact in dealing with these lobbies that are opposing the normalization process. Um, Similarly, on the Indian side, we have got 614 items on um, our sensitive list and the largest sector that accounts for the, the major chunk is textiles. And here again, we are uh, basically the private sector feels the threat in, in textiles which is fabrics. And uh, if we were to import fabrics, then what we are, if, if you are protecting this sector, what we are actually doing is protecting the large scale sector because most of the fabric. Uh, which is coming from the mill sector is high priced and high quality and that is what India would be, uh, that is what India would be competing with Pakistan if we were to open up to Pakistan. So we are not really protecting the small scale sector from where the, uh, the, uh, the, the power loom sector which is producing low quality, low price segment. So under, we are saying that this is what we are protecting but actually we are protecting the large scale. So in that sense there is no rationale to offer protection to uh, uh, the textile items. Um, it is true that there is a lot of untapped potential and there are a lot of figures uh, that people have estimated through various exercises, statistical and econometric. Uh, but the fact is that how can this uh, trade be realized and this is where I think the role of institutions becomes very important. And if we see uh, when we are talking about the last two decades, some of I think I can say that there are three major changes that took place. One was that we uh, uh, modified the maritime protocol and brought it on international rules. The second is that we opened up the road route and the third is that we, op we opened up, um, uh, uh, the, 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 the third was that we, uh, the, 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 uh, that we, the trade, the positive list has expanded. So clearly the institutions have played a role in uh, in, in managing this change and uh, therefore there is a lesson to be learnt that even though this, the relations were so strained, the institutions have actually uh, managed this change. 
The other thing that I would like to talk about is the informal institutions, which is, and they've played a very important role. And how can we minimize their role and expand the role of formal institutions? In fact, SDPI has just done a study on estimating the informal uh, trade, and what they found is that 87% of the informal import is basically in textiles, 4% is in tires, 2.3% is in auto components, and 1.4% is in pharma. And it's most of it is happening through Dubai, and Dubai is really playing the role of a facilitator. It's it's playing the role of a uh, uh, of a risk guarantor. So clearly, these mechanisms are not in place, and that is what we need to address for this whole trade normalization to actually happen. So just sub simply granting MFN is not the solution. It's uh, these other factors that need to be uh, uh, brought into the fore. Uh, we've also done a trade perception survey recently, and there we found that the um, average awareness level is significantly higher among Indian respondents compared to Pakistani respondents. And this is on all the trade policy measures because it's such a complex package that we have. Uh, so, whether if traders are not aware of the policies, then how can they even take benefit of the policies that are actually uh, uh, operational? And similarly, on SPS and TBT, it was quite interesting what we found was that. Uh, that the S, that while SPS is a problem for the Pakistanis meeting SPS standards, uh, meeting TBT standards is not. And here again, I think what I would like to point out is, again, it's about awareness. And when we're talking about awareness, the fact that Pakistan is a member of ILAC and that India is also a member of ILAC, the countries recognized it only two years ago. And it's, it's, it was always, it was there in 2009 and only after this recognition, uh, I think it's slowly percolating down and therefore it's not uh, coming up as a barrier, that much as a barrier and that is what I think our perception survey has been able to capture. Uh, just two more points on uh, what lessons can be learned basically from East Asia. Uh, uh, I think one lesson is that what they've done very uh, successfully in terms of economic corridors is something that we've not looked at. And maybe we should look at it in terms of economic corridors. Mm -hmm. Secondly, when we're looking at connectivity, we've only focused on opening the border. But we're not looking at it in terms of connecting the region to, uh, to, to say, East Asia or to West Asia. There's some change happening because through Myanmar, uh, we are now very actively seeing the role of Bangladesh and Myanmar in connecting to East Asia. If we were to similarly think of Pakistan and Afghanistan, the role of Pakistan and Afghanistan in connecting to West Asia, I think it would there would be a far more buy-in and this whole concentration on just India and Pakistan will be uh, much larger because more countries will have gains and more countries will have stakes in it. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Nisha, for, for that. Uh, Intervention. I think it, uh, you made a very good point. This is, of course, uh, India-Pakistan uh, trade normalization is a milestone in, in trade, uh, regional trade uh, integration in the region, and to take uh, uh, some uh, process uh, forward. And uh, it is, um, it uh, we have to do a lot. It, I can see from your presentation and uh, and the role that others can play, research institutions and uh, other um, entities, especially um, uh, informal networking uh, can make a big uh, difference in, in connecting uh, markets, connecting countries, because it's politically, you know, we, this is what we have seen, right, politically it is difficult, but now when you come to lower level and we, if we can, can connect through various other informal uh, channels, including business partnerships. I think that will really help to move that forward and then in particular business set, sector can push the government to take the, the process forward. Okay, the, 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 uh, the other major issue that we are discussing is improving trade presentation. That I think we, sh we will put that also on the, on the table. Um, uh, Prabir mm -hmm. has done a lot of work on this. Um, and uh, Prabhi, can you uh, briefly explain the situation with regard to trade facilitation um, in, in South Asia and especially um, that uh, um, moving towards well-functioning and futuristic customs and border procedures in South Asian countries. Um, well, this is, this is an issue that of course, you know, we were, we were, the countries are very busy with trade liberalization and trade 
trade uh, facilitation was somewhat neglected because our commerce ministries anywhere in the in in, in not only in South Asia but also uh, in the rest of the region that uh, commerce ministries are busy with negotiating creating market taxes through WTO process, regional agreement, bilateral agreement and creating market taxes. But uh, to capture the benefit from this market taxes, you need to have trade facilitation which is not really, really happening and, and this is what we need to work and South Asia definitely need to do a lot in, in that. Prabhi. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I'm uh, very grateful to all the organizers of South Asian Economic Summit for the invitation. Now, mm, I follow the uh, same cue that Professor Mukherjee, Salim uh, Raihan, Professor Taneja, and Chairman himself, uh, uh, what they said. The tone is that we, we moved from trade liberalization to uh, trade facilitation. Now, uh, how much we have done for uh, trade liberalization in terms of tariff cuts? documented and some of them already cited some beautiful um, and uh, useful information. Now on trade facilitation, as the chair has asked uh, my views and what is happening at the ground level, I am very optimistic in the sense that when it comes to Pakistan, uh, bilaterally countries are doing, uh, yes, I may use the word pretty well. Um, we may, may, may not be knowing it that on India and Pakistan, still we have at the border going against uh, WTO principle, Pakistan gives a positive list. Uh, they do not allow negative, uh, negative list to be in, uh, enforced. Now at the border, uh, the customs officials between India and Pakistan, they are far advanced coming up with accepting the electronic documents for trade exchange. Then uh, when it comes with Bangladesh for India, for example. So somehow, uh, when you know they need, they feel there is a priority, and every country is in South Asia, they look for India. So for trade facilitation, is comes because when you cross the border, you have time difference. Except between India and Sri Lanka, all other countries within India you have a time gap. But when you have the time gap with Sri Lanka, you don't have a physical border. You, you have ocean. Otherwise, you have a time gap with other ones. So the problem is that uh, the real life problem that nobody would like to give an extra hour work or extra minute work at the border and the border does not function as a 24 7 like an airport. So, if the Indian customs opens at uh, 5, 15 minutes gap then uh, same time you know your truck uh, got stuck in between. So, also in Bangladesh or Myanmar between Pakistan and Afghanistan. So, there is a strong uh, harmon you know disharmonizations between them and it is a bit, bit difficult to harm the land, the people, everybody was harmonized 60, 70 years ago. Now this got fragmented. You are going to harmonize rules, standards, 60, 60 years they have come up with your own national <laughs> identity. Suddenly you cannot expect we give up our sovereign rights and regulations come together. There is a challenge you know we are discussing this for years. On trade facilitation, that is why I find that what is happening somewhere the priority is given like the customs officials dealing with Pakistan. because. Indian governments feel and studies showing both sides that if we do not have a you know co comprehensive arrangement at the border that is why Indian government uh, set up the you know, land port authority and the first project done very nicely and I have seen in my own eyes that how the artery border and the Waga is doing pretty well and uh, that is done. But if you look at the other integrated check posts it is not yet done or in the halfway somewhere in the Myanmar distant visit I seen and even the land was identified, but no, nobody, there is a political problem, conflict between the state and center setting up integrated check posts. So, <laughs> what I mean that trade facilitation as a comprehensive tool is yet to take a step in the region. Now, what is the literature and uh, the, the, the primary survey indicates? First and foremost uh, example that we have in front of us is uh, chairman's own office. Uh, trade investment division, they came out with a uh, very recently Yan Dual and Taifeng Wang a survey of the Asia Pacific member countries, their opinion, the perceptions about what is exa exactly the problem in the trade facilitations. It is a kind of the trade process, procedure, transparency, documentation, what Salim came out with his own study, what Nisa said, those are coming in the, um, you know, in the priority. Means that if I am an exporter and importer, I would like to be very much clearly informed uh, that if there are NTMs, 
uh, there are uh, regulatory barriers, it should be published somewhere. I am hooked into all the time in my uh, electronic gadget. Please don't tell me I go thousand pages in somewhere in the some cell by some officers. So those, I, that's the transparency is very much important. In that way, there is not much progress, and I think this will be very common in the trade facilitation when it comes. Now, <coughs> when you look Sorry. at the South Asia as a reason, SAC Secretariat is, uh, I must say, uh, and uh, with a pride, I should not hide it, it's a very weak organization. It cannot integrate the region of a population of one and a half billion. I have no hesitation to say, I've been telling it. Now, with this, why it is a weak organization, we know, we know uh, why it is, but even then, we need to strengthen it, we need to support it. They can perform, yes, it is not that they won't be. So, re trade facilitation of the region is yet to see an agenda of the whole, because every country has looked into it nationally. Nationally, when you think, the data we normally quote, which I personally don't believe that World Bank doing business database, they have a fundamental loopholes, if you look at carefully. So, we don't, I don't, I don't, don't quote it. We have come out with a new database in parallel challenging the World Bank doing business database. It will be coming up, the ADB and SCAP joint publications through and very soon, I think it will be released. All they said that yes, over time, time to export, time to import, cost to export, cost to import have come down. And this is a kind of an, you know, endogenous, who has influenced it to reduce is very difficult to capture. But all are working, identified trade facilitation is the priority uh, and that is why countries that nationally doing as the India Pakistan customs <coughs> officials are doing or India Nepal customs officials are doing to accept electronic signature when you have Nepal's export and import throughput of Calcutta we call it electronic acceptance of CTD custom transit documents. Because in the recent study I seen again there is a myth India intentionally uh, delayed Nepal shipment from port of Calcutta or India intentionally delayed Nepal shipment with Bangladesh using a corridor of 54 kilometer. India intentionally delayed Bang Bhutan Strait with Bangladesh again in 112 corridors in the northern part of West Bengal part of India. Actually, through the field survey, what we found, it is not that. It is the opening of the letter of credit in the Nepalese bank, which takes 14 days. It is the insurance premium that Nepalese companies are charged to the Nepal export of carpet to the Germany, where the Germans are very much fond of the Nepals. So, those are the private sectors that are very much involved in the trade facilitation. The government has a certainly facilitating role, equally important in the private sector, where if you look at, if you clap down the, you know, for the sake of discussion, doing business database in separate categories, it takes documentation, picks up 60 to 70 percent of our time. Who prepare the documents? Private sector. And where these are, uh, you know, strong role, I think we need to do uh, more actively. Final point is, what is the progress that we have done? If you see, you know, uh, jointly in the South Asia, uh, you know, I think the uh, main problem, you know, progress is that we have reduced 118 documents that I estimated 5, 6 years ago to 17 documents. What we have done, e-filing of documentations, customs house agent of these countries, they are relatively trained how to use the software, submit your document, Dhaka custom house, Chittagong custom house, Calcutta custom house, Delhi custom house, they are electronic digitized and uh, uh, those are, you know, development as done, where the challenge are now to harmonize all those. So, what we have not done and we think that we should have a more aggressive research and to work on is basically some of the common projects of South Asia, like regional single window. Single window means every country is doing implementing. By the way, all the countries they have introduced the trade facilitation team, exclusive team, coming away, breaking away from the existing bureaucracy. India is a <laughs> an example, uh, they have not yet done it. Uh, they feel the Commerce Ministry official. Uh, and the finance ministry officers, they feel that they do, they want to, uh, it is better that they continue working on that. Other countries, they have come out with the National Trade Facilitation Committee and exclusive, because exclusivity is very much important when you have to deliver the de discharge your activities. <coughs> so, uh, one, one more minute, what we need to work for the South Asia to take ahead our uh, uh, trade uh, uh, lead uh, regional integration is that some of the things that other blocks are doing. ASEAN 2015, they are coming up with the common market, they have a master plan on connectivity, they are implementing the projects, very dedicated. I, 
for the professionally, I am part of some of the uh, activities there as well. What I seen that by 2015, ASEAN will have a single custom single window, at least the six countries, if not the four. Now, if you are going to train, you will have kind of a pseudo customs union, and that will be done with through the <coughs> electronic systems. If you do not have, you are losing because when you cross the border, you need to think as a pair. Uh, it you just have to forget about your uh, national uh, geographical boundary because if you save the time this side and the savings is low stage while crossing the border and when you reach to that side, then it is a com completely reverse. So, in that way we will lose uh, and very highly when it comes to the ASEAN because they are going to have a single window. We need to work on that, make our customs 24 7 kind of thing. If airport can operate, seaport can operate, why not the land port? And, uh, automated economic operators, human resource development in ASICUDA plus or global plus being used, not used. So, those kind of human resource development, you know, we have to be devout. Every problem from Geneva cannot come uh, to solve your any software problem that we have in ASICUDA uh, or ASICUDA global, the software that you use for the customs. Transit is very much important, uh, you know, and I, I no need to say the why it is, everybody knows and what Nisha said, corridor. Uh, and you know, uh, yes, ex absolutely. But what is the corridor we are talking about? Corridor means the quality of life. It is not just passing goods from one country to another, investment, enterprising, networking, supply chain, those things are very important. What will facilitate that? At this time, I think that maybe we start thinking for a common currency or kind of a South Asian currency okay. if we have this problem, you know. So <laughs> these are the things we need to. Uh, look at. So, thank you very much. I stop here. I cross my time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Prabhi. Uh, you came up with very innovative proposal, including South Asian currency. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, the point is taken that uh, basically at the national level, you need to come up with some uh, efficient procedures, right? Trade facilitation procedures and processes. And then you need to harmonize. If you are going to increase intra regional trade, you need to harmonize those processes. Uh, and and, and using uh, basically IT uh, technology. Now, what we what we have is that uh, recently, I don't know, maybe you must be aware that uh, uh, SCAP is working on a paperless trade arrangement for the whole uh, region. I mean, Asia Pacific region, where we want to convert some of the uh, paper-based documentation into uh, digital form, so that. The, the transaction can take um, uh, at a um, uh, uh, efficiently at a um, uh, time, very short time, and then uh, this is something we are going to work towards. But I believe that uh, first of all, you need to have a national level, so you need to have a national single window, and then come into sub regional, and then the region. It is a lone way, but we what we want to do is to uh, put the process in place the, so that countries will work toward that, sub-regions will work toward that at the end, uh, we know hopefully we will have a, a well Asian um, uh, all, all countries connected. Okay, now I want to move to last two interventions uh, looking at the uh, country level, what is happening at the country level and uh, Pakistan and Nepal, we have two panelists from there. Now we discuss tariff and non-tariff barriers and, and trade facilitation. My question to our two last panelists is that uh, uh, what is what are the major um, institutional barriers and and um, where um, that they, they are hindering the process of reducing uh, tariff and non tariff barriers and uh, and also um, uh, moving towards greater regional integration and what is the political factors behind that and basically national perspective your own experience on the, from your own country. Um, can I start with, uh, 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 well, uh, Mr. Khalid Mahmoud from Pakistan, please, yeah. then to Nepal. Thank you, Chair. Uh, it's a very interesting topic. Today I was happy to see that the, the major contributing uh, force into the whole economic integration, that is private sector development, oh. that has been put in the center stages. 
Uh, in the morning, we had a wonderful session, and uh, the way it concluded, uh, Sayyid Malwari Sahib, he is an uh, iconic figure in Pakistan, the industry as well as the education institution, that the only thing comes to his head is that uh, head of states should be putting their heads together too often. So I think that sums up the whole thing, that what should be the spirit, what is the way forward, mm -hmm. and how we can uh, move forward. Uh, well, I mean, focusing on my talk, uh, India in the whole South region, in the whole sector, has a very unique role. As we say in the manufacturing, it is China versus non-China. The rest of the world put together and the China on one side. It is that sort of a unique role and relationship of India with and the South region. Uh, India has a very unique relationship politically, economically, all that, and there is a conflict history between India and Pakistan also. India has some sort of a unique relationship with Bangladesh and the issues with the Bangladesh also. Similarly, with Nepal also. So, the matter is not that simple. We can always, I mean, describe all the things. Uh, I have been coming to these forums and I have been listening and uh, going through various studies also. Uh, we are too often being told that this much potential exists and this can be done and this can be done. Uh, but we are rich in the I mean, studies, we are rich in the I mean, telling that what are the problems existing and so on and so forth. But somehow, uh, we are much short on the implementation of the, mm -hmm. things, the creative initiatives which are required and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. Uh, I think uh, one sector which can actually help to foster these relationships is the private sector which we are talking about. Uh, I wish that more private sector people could have been engaged into this kind of a dollar. It can be very useful. Uh, as far as the SAFTA is concerned, uh, there has been uh, I mean, uh, many expectations, but somehow those expectations so far have not been fulfilled. Technically, as was being explained by my colleagues also, uh, there are a lot of measures, there are a lot of studies, there are a lot of institutional and policy thrust which have been taken up. But at the end of the day, what we see is, that uh, solutions and the measures and the initiatives are not coming up. Uh, I have two impressions. I have been traveling to the South Asian countries quite frequently during the last couple of years. What I see is that there is a very strong urge of people-to-people -people contact. I find a substantive uh, urge uh, of B2B, business-to-business -business contacts. Uh, but somehow, I do not find that zeal, uh, that kind of a vigor and commitment at government-to-government -government level. And so far, what I see is that every, most of the countries, particularly Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Nepal, we have some sort of a stated stance, uh, which has been there for the last two decades or so. And uh, we do a lot of nice talking to each other. But at the end of the day, uh, I still have to see a substantial movement from that stated position of these countries, which is basically taking the postage of all SAFTA as well as the SARC also. Uh, <clears throat> Another thing which was talked in this uh, plenary session also, uh, Sayyid Babar Ali Sahib and a couple of other colleagues also mentioned. If you go into the reality, I come from the private sector all along, I have been into the private sector, so I'll be focusing more from the private sector, the reality perspective than the academic uh, version and all that. Uh, in Southeast, South Asia, most of our industrialists, uh, the way they have grown up during the last five decades or six decades, particularly after India and Pakistan gained the uh, independence, that we, our economies have grew with a lot of protections. And most of our industrial development has taken place in that uh, arena, in that environment, where most of the businesses, uh, they have that rent-seeking mentality. They would like to have some sort of uh, protection also. We can give a lot of pep talk to each other about the trade liberalization. We can be talking about all these uh, improved uh, trade facilitations and uh, getting away with the trade barriers and so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, if uh, you really start talking about, there are various kind of lobbies. For example, in India and Pakistan, if you say, uh, like pharma industry, auto, uh, mobile industry, agriculture parts, and so on and so forth, and then suddenly you find so many lobbies which are basically holding back from all that kind of a thing. So that uh, mindset of uh, protectionism uh, is very much there. I can see the reduction into that mindset during the last couple of years, but I still feel that that is very much there. Now, moving on, I have been shown the green light as well. Uh, I feel the hope which I see is the increased and improved and more energetic and dynamic role of the private sector. 
uh, politics in India, politics in Bangladesh or Pakistan or even Sri Lanka also. Now the businesses have grown so huge and the politics is so expensive that there is a kind of a nexus which is growing up and getting stronger and stronger between the business communities, the associations and the politicians also. As was mentioned in the plenary session also that now, I mean, uh, contesting the election is uh, very expensive. So I have seen that during the last two decades or so, there has been improved influence of the business community on the government yeah. and they are influencing the policies also. So I think now we are coming to that stage there where I can very clearly see during the last couple of years that the Indian business community has a very strong and a positive influence in the government policies and all that. And uh, so is happening in Pakistan also. So I think to me uh, that is going to be a ray of hope and I am very confident of that, that uh, all these talks aside, uh, but the private sector is now uh, aware they have the improved uh, confidence, they have the improved uh, business to business contacts also and now they are influencing the governments also. There I think that momentum should build up. The next and the last point which I would see is that uh, whatever the relations uh, exist, I think a depth needs to be created into those businesses. Uh, I see that uh, wherever the regional growth has taken place or the regional trade has strengthened, there has been a much a deeper economic relationship, which I don't find many in fact. For example, the FDI between Pakistan and India is almost non-existing and FDI with other uh, countries also is non-existing. Uh, we don't have uh, like uh, too many joint ventures with each other also. So if you see the history of uh, all these uh, regional growth, so I think a much deeper economic uh, integration is required like Pakistan and likewise India and other uh, countries also. We don't have too many banking arrangements and bank branches with each other also. Once we are dealing with the Bangladesh, we are having a seven severe problem with the banking also. Uh, India has some of the finest uh, world institutions also, but it's very seldom I yet have to come across where a Pakistani student is studying in some Indian university or some Indian is studying into a couple of other universities. We have some wonderful institutions in Pakistan and so must be a couple of institutions in Bangladesh and other countries also. But at that level, we don't have that sort of, uh, I mean, strength available there. If people to people contact and uh, all these sort of things happen, I think this in itself can give a lot of momentum at various levels. Uh, for example, from Pakistan, I see uh, there is a lot of medical tourism taking place to the India. And uh, I mean, the people have a lot of praises for the yeah, medical institutions and medical health care of the India. Uh, but yet I have to see that why that uh, we are not having that sort of uh, arrangement for the educational institution, transfer of technology and so on and so forth. And the last thing is that uh, uh, why not to have some uh, cross-national brands? Oh. For example, a lot of Indian brands are being yeah. sold in Pakistan. The airtime is being used also. The advertisement is also there. Indian industry, uh, the film industry and uh, many other products, there are household names in India also. But we have a lot of difficulty. I mean, one I mean, company in Pakistan, if they want to operate from India, there is a list of hurdles. And likewise, if this Pakistani company wants to operate in India, there are a lot of hurdles also. So I think at the end of the day, what I see is that whatever uh, is uh, taking place at the moment, business to business level, uh, government to government level and these kind of a policy think levels. The momentum now is the private sector and frankly what I see is during the next five to say, ten years the agenda of the economic integration in SAP and SAFTA will be through the private sector. Thank you. So I think well you know this again we have some some uh, work already done on the, in all these areas but a lot more to be done. And we need to explore these new areas to uh, uh, further improve integration. It's not just only trade. That is the, that is the whole purpose. Uh, it can be in other areas that will help um, simultaneously. Okay, now shall I, can I come to Nepal now? Dr. Ram, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I was just looking at the report, just of the global competitiveness report that was just circulated in the last session. It says, strong Asian tigers, dynamic ASEAN, and lagging shark. And it says since 19, uh, 2006, since 2006, India has slipped by 20 points. Mm -hmm. Pakistan has slipped by, slipped by 15 points, slumped by Meanwhile, Pakistan, the second largest country in South Asia, has slumped 
28 positions, mm. the fourth biggest decline out of all economic studies. Nepal and Bangladesh have also been unable to improve their standings over the years. I think the star performer has been Sri Lanka, this Asia, Asia having improved 19 ranks since 19, uh, 2000, 2006. Mm. This clearly shows that despite what uh, we might have done, we might have said, and we might have made, uh, you know, the decisions, announcement in the summit, mm -hmm. uh, we have failed very badly. If you look at the overall intra-regional trade, it is not more than 5% mm -hmm. of the total. Mm -hmm. That is the traditional pattern. So even after SAFTA or SAFTA or SAFTA and you know, negative list, cutting down the negative list and whatnot, <laughs> things have not improved. Uh, we have to, in blunt words, we have failed uh, miserably uh, that we have to accept. If you look at the uh, intra-regional investment, they say it is not more than 2% of the total. In ASEAN, it is 27%. As percent of GDP, intra-regional trade in South Asia is 2-3%. In ASEAN, it is about 20 percent. In ASEAN, it is about 20 percent. So, uh, South Asia has failed miserably. Having said that, uh, distinguished uh, panelists have spoken on various aspects of uh, tariff, non-tariff issues, uh, para-tariff uh, issues. I would like to talk something about uh, the uh, supply-side constraint, the facilitation constraint. Mm for countries like Nepal. I have uh, brought some figures published by Doing Business Report. Our ranking in doing business is very poor. Ranking in doing business across borders, which has to do with trade facilitation and others. Nepal's ranking is something like 100. 42 out of 180, 147 countries out of 183. Next only to Afghanistan. Af Afghanistan has 183 positions. Nepal has 147. Bangladesh has 112th position. Bhutan has 161 position. And the, I'm talking mainly of the, the uh, land uh, this uh, 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 LDCs. So we are way behind uh, many other countries in the region. Nepal's particularly from Nepal's talking from Nepal's perspective, uh, it is not a very good situation. Number of documents required for export is nine. It takes 41 days for the export to be completely processed. Mm -hmm. And the cost of export per ton is 1960, while the region's average is 1058. Mm -hmm. Our cost of export per container in dollar terms is 1960. Bangladesh, it is about half of that. Mm -hmm. Afghanistan, it is about double of that, 3865. Pakistan 611, Sri Lanka 715, Bhutan 1210, average is 1511, India is 1055. That shows particularly country like Nepal, small country, landlocked, LDC, suffer significantly because of facilitation constraints and also because of supply side constraints that reduces competitiveness, that reduces our export potential, that increases the cost of doing business, cost of export, and whatnot. Uh, we talked of that India's offer of, uh, you know, reducing the negative list to 25 items, and for LDC, uh, zero tariff. But much of the advantage occurring from this zero tariff has been neutralized by para-tariff and, and non-tariff constraints. Like recently, 
we have imposed 12% excise duty on garments exported from in, in, uh, from, from Nepal. Uh, similarly, a special additional duty, 4%. For the, so this neutralizes the advantage derived from the free trade arrangement. And we don't have very big multinational companies operating in Nepal exporting ready-made garments in India. The downside of this is that now there is informal trade going on. Mm. They escape the formal channel. This is hampering both countries. The other uh, constraint we face is uh, with regard to the standards issue. Much of the Nepalese, Nepalese products going from uh, Nepal to the Indian market, agricultural products, uh, they are subjected to the standards and sanitary and phyto sanitary or whatever you call uh, standards, which will be difficult to comply because of limited quarantine facilities. And many of the fresh agricultural products, which would have to be exported immediately if they are subjected to quarantine facilities in Calcutta and some faraway places, then the whole advantage is completely neutralized. So this. Uh, non-tariff and para-tariff measures or constraints severely reduces our uh, competitiveness. That is the uh, position we, 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 we face. That is the problem we face. And the present mechanism for dispute settlement also is not very easy. You report to the SARC secretariat, then you forward it to the committee of exports. Uh, which is not a very good and weak mechanism. I think something to be done uh, with respect uh, on, on that issue. On other issue uh, that uh, we suffer, uh, there are poor constraints which reduce the competitiveness that is infrastructural, particularly from the perspective of small countries like ours. We have very poor uh, infrastructure, very bad roads, narrow roads, not properly maintained, human capital constraint, access to finance, and we suffer from economies of scale. So what is needed is uh, some uh, funding, integrated funding, so that we can upgrade the infrastructural facilities and supply side constraint to raise our competitiveness. For that, the SARC Development Fund, which has practically remained unutilized for the last so many years, we have hundreds of millions of dollars lying in the banks, unutilized. Why can't we make use of that fund in upgrading the infrastructure, particularly of the LDCs, and relatively uh, underdeveloped and poorer, smaller uh, SARC countries? At the same time, there is a lot of interest coming from the observer countries. We have something like eight observers plus the World Bank and the ADB, I think, eager to support. What we can do in the immediate future is solicit funds, support from these countries and agencies to make investment in smaller countries of SARC so that uh, particularly with a view to upgrade the infrastructure. Uh, modernizing the modernizing ports, airports, uh, road corridors, transmission lines, and all that. That could increase the level of competitiveness uh, that uh, from where we suffer. There is another also report from the, yeah, I think the, this is again from the World Bank, logistic performance index. In that also, we fare very poorly. Another constraint uh, we face is uh, that there is no harmonization of customs data. Mm. We are using one set of data. We call it Ashikura. India is using some other system so that data is not 
harmonize properly. As a result of which, trade is delayed, export is delayed, import is delayed. So because of all these constraints, I think South Asia is not doing very well, and particularly within South Asia, smaller uh, countries, uh, less developed countries are suffering more than others. So I think the coming year should see more attention towards the position of uh, particularly to improve the uh, supply side constraints of smaller economies of South Asia, particularly the landlocked and small countries. And at the same time, uh, improve the procedural delays and other policy related issues that will help these countries. Thank you. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it is uh, again very interesting, especially uh, various constraints that um, uh, the, the re sub region is facing uh, <coughs> in terms of uh, um, when it comes to regional integration. You specifically focus on, on supply side uh, constraints. Okay, so um, uh, thank you once again. Now, um, I was thinking to have a follow up question from the uh, panelists, but we don't have much time, so what we want to do is that maybe we'll open the uh, discussion here. Uh, we heard so many, well, we know the constraints and, and uh, the situation with regard to uh, intra-regional trade and regional integration and so forth. So what we would like to see, especially our, our um, organizers would like to see from this uh, discussion, some action points, like say five or ten uh, action points uh, to take forward. Okay, we'll start from here. Yeah, and I'd, like to compliment, uh, I'd like to compliment uh, okay. uh, the, the panel for, you know, for excellent presentations. Um, I, you know, I'm particularly impressed with uh, what Mr. Pravier uh, they had to say about, you know, improving the, you know, the facilities of, of trade, you know, 7-Eleven, white country customs across the borders work uh, around the clock. I mean, there's uh, lack of employment, employ more customs officers, uh, and, and make, make things go much faster. Um, you know, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Look around, uh, you know, ASEAN countries, they are very pragmatic, very economical. Uh, let us have a de in, in detailed study of what they have done to facilitate trade among themselves. And let us not go to America and Mexico and Canada to find out how they are doing. Let's just follow what ASEAN have de done and, and replicate. We can't go wrong on that. It will be cheaper, simpler, and quicker. And, uh, and, and let's follow that. And I would very much like to make a plea to our friends from India. India being the big or the biggest brother in this thing, they have to take the initiative. India has seven neighbors. They have a running love hate with Pakistan but are the other six other neighbors happy with India uh, with trade with other things you've got to look into the merit yourself there must be something you know needs to be done that that you are loved by everybody rather than be scared of everybody thank you okay so please not uh, the panelists please not whatever uh, uh, given to you okay Biswajit then followed by Nagesh and well yes Okay, many, many hands, I'll, uh, there are two. Yeah, th uh, thank you, Chair. I, I have just, uh, just two points. You know, one is, uh, you know, just doing some I introspection. You know, uh, Nisha said that uh, you've been talking about, you know, India and Pakistan, you know, t liberalization has been going on for 20 years. For equally long, if not more, we have been talking about the potential of South Asian trade, <laughs> you know. And I'm really surprised if there is so much of potential you know, of, of trade that all of us are, you know, putting in these copious reports for decades now. Either we have gone wrong in estimating or we have not been able to convey to the, you know, the, the private sector that, you know, there is a buy-in out, out here. You know, so, you know, if there is a demand, why shouldn't the private sector buy in into this? So there is a, 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 a serious problem and if there is, uh, as we heard in the morning, the private sector it doesn't follow governments in our countries these days. They actually twist governments. They're, they're twisting government policies. So if they want it, and we heard about cronyism, 
Now, if they can get, get all the wrong things done in, in our own government, you know, in our own countries, why can't they twist the governments to get the right things done and take advantage of the trade? So all these barriers we are talking about, you know, it's not coming from from somewhere that we don't know. Mm. These are being created by the government mm -hmm. officials. Mm. We've been telling them time and time again, uh, you know, and uh, so somewhere there is a missing link. And uh, and we got to addre address that problem. I, I think uh, we also should plead guilty, and it was a point made by Mr. Shah in the morning uh, in the plenary, that uh, Communication, uh, you mm. know, uh, uh, the, the 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 dissemination of all the, the communication uh, levels is really at an appalling level. Okay. We do all these reports. Uh, I don't think the policymakers understand them. And I've talked to the policymakers back home. They don't understand. They don't understand models. They want to understand. They want to know what is the doables. Now, if you throw a report at them. You can forget about uh, them reading that and getting some something out of uh, this thing. So I think you know uh, one has got to understand why is it that uh, uh, the industry, the government, and the think think tanks, who seem to be talking about potentials all the time, and potentials never get realized in this part of the world in our all areas. I think you know, including this, uh, needs to be thought of. The second is a suggestion that, uh, like uh, Barbara Ali Saab said, that you know we need to you know we don't have to go all over uh, the world to look at best best practices. In South Asia, we do not have a, it, none of the governments have trade promotion organizations. Yeah. Now, we know as researchers how difficult it is to get information on whatever is happening in terms of, you know, the, you know, the, the documentation. And this is something that the South Asian, Southeast Asian countries did the first thing. Yeah. They have trade promotion organizations where, you know, it works as a clearinghouse. You can get all the information, so you don't have to run from pillar to post. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, these are the things that I just wanted to put as a Correct. suggestion and a question. Yep. Uh, thank you, us. thank you. I, in, fa in fact, this uh, communication that that was uh, the stress there, in the, I think this is very important. We are doing so much in the research institution and all this, so we need to get this to uh, uh, the policymakers in a way that they can read and, and get absorbing. absorbing. Yes, yes. No, not that big report. Yes. This is this is the way they, we need to we need to package in such a way that okay, Nagesh, and then we will come to Nihal and then here. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, uh, Ravi. Uh, well, uh, I want to make two points. One is uh, responding to your own point where, uh, that whether why FDI yes. in the region is not taking place. I think uh, FDI uh, is all taking place uh, in some pairs, especially India, Sri Lanka, where India is the third largest source of FDI now. And Sri Lankan FDI is also going to India. So it is two-way. Uh, in fact, Brandix, a company of, uh, you know, uh, Sri Lanka, has set up a special economic zone in India. And using, uh, combining the entire value chain in the industry uh, from fabric to the end product in one location. So uh, if you look at why it is happening in this case and not in others, I think there are two factors which will stand out. One is a functional FTA. There is a proper functional FTA, so businessmen on the both sides of the border know that they can produce in one country and bring it in other and uh, vice versa. So value chains are actually beginning to happen with in this case. And the second, uh, the, uh, second factor <coughs> is connectivity, the, the efficient uh, port handling and all that is, is there. And so for the value chains to happen, which is uh, actually in the, which is the process in which FDI takes place, uh, are beginning to take shape in India, Sri Lanka case. Look at the number of, com uh, number of value added products that are exported by Sri Lanka to India now. And um, many of them are actually produced by Indian joint ventures or Indian investments in Sri Lanka, uh, back to India. The second uh, point I want to pick up, uh, you know, uh, uh, point with uh, um, uh, Salim uh, about NTMs. You know, uh, I would be surprised if any sensible country doesn't have NTMs. You know, uh, SPS and TPT, you know, just give you one example of uh, uh, melamine-laced milk powder, baby powder, 
uh, baby milk powder in China, killing 40 children in one night. And then, you know, if it, would you import that kind of uh, milk powder? No. Uh, would you import a s cement produced by some company which is half r sand and half cement? So otherwise, the buildings you build with that and collapse next day. So uh, any country is allowed by WTO and GATT b before that to have their standards for which are applicable to everybody. So when you import, you ensure that your human health and other you know, safety standards are not compromised. And these are imposed for the uh, very good region. They are not to be treated as barriers, you know. And, and so uh, if the country has not got them, that means they are yet to reach the level of in institutional evolution where they begin to think about this. So it's a process of evolution, but they are not the barriers. Uh, I give you the example of India-China trade. In 2003, it was less than a billion dollars. Today, it is $70 billion. So, uh, you know, so these barrier measures have not stopped India China trade to <coughs> and expand by leaps and bounds. What is important to look at is whether these uh, NTMs are discriminatory, whether they are blocking a particular country's trade. Then they become a uh, you know, problem, and they need to be addressed. Now, uh, Mr. Mahat uh, raised about the question, uh, you know, issue of uh, the uh, paratariffs and countervailing duties. You know, these, these are uh, uh, duties which are imposed on local industry. Uh, you know, the excise duty is paid by the local industry or uh, every single product produced in India, and uh, I'm sure production taxes are everywhere, uh, uh, pays certain tax to the government. Now, if importers do not pay that, that means importers are getting an advantage, uh, advantage over the local producers. So to equalize that, yes, uh, then you uh, impose a countervailing duty. This is a common practice across the world. So it's not also to be taken as, a, you know, uh, NTM. So that that's uh, uh, I think uh, just. Uh, okay. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Nagi. Okay, I I will try to give everybody uh, the opportunity, but please be brief. Uh, so we start a little late, so we have about another five minutes or so. I mean after uh, twelve forty-five. But Sark was mentioned, and, and Sapta was mentioned a number of times from the panel, and our former Secretary General is here. Uh, we should give him an uh, opportunity to uh, respond here. Yeah, thank you. I'll be very brief. Uh, actually, uh, there's this whole question about the potential and the actual use of that potential. And I think uh, within South Asia, while there is tremendous cultural assimilities and all the rest of it, I think what has happened is that uh, somehow the linkages are not there. Now, if you look at the meeting here itself, there was a single representative of the government present at that mm. uh, meeting just before this morning. Yeah, right. yeah. Nor was there a single person from SAC present there either. Now, as a retired recycled <laughs> SAC wala, <laughs> <laughs> retired recycled <laughs> government wala, I can see the, the, the problem in this whole thing because now what I feel or what I think I can do, I can pass on. It will be a sort of a short note uh, to the secretary, to the president, or maybe if I meet the president. Okay. But how much of this really gets into the governmental sector exactly. uh, is the biggest problem, I think. I think right through here, all the SAFK encounters, I found that the state sector, the connectivity between the two is very slim. And I think that is where we need something. And second point is, of course, uh, within India and Sri Lanka, again, because there is uh, direct contact between the corporate sectors, a lot of the things are working, tourism and things like that are going on. For example, even uh, if you look at aviation, although Sri Lankan Airlines is not such a big airline, we have the largest number of stopovers in India of any airline in the world. So that sort of thing works out if the two corporate sectors can directly come to an encounter and then go to government and say, okay, these are the benefits for both our countries, let's do it. So that works. But unfortunately, in the larger scale, uh, this whole thing is sort of uh, stuck and there are also uh, very briefly, I won't take too much of time, political factors mm. within India and Sri Lanka which has problems. Now, for example, the beautiful word that was used, I, I forget which politician used it, uh, he talked of co coalition compulsions that India has to encounter when dealing with Sri Lanka on the human rights front. And that is again the whole question of the <laughs> Tamil Nadu state okay. uh, having an impact uh, on what is going on in Sri Lanka. So these uh, elements are there and these can be confronted. 
if the corporate sector is also tough enough to say, look, if you do this, yes. you are going to stop this. And uh, so this encounter between the corporate sector and the, oh. and the state yes. is, I think, something that we need to promote. Oh. And I think maybe it should be done in smaller sort of uh, knots. Uh, now, this encounter was superb in the sense that uh, IPS has been able to bring a massive uh, round of people from the Commonwealth, yes. from yes. Uh, the banks, all that. But uh, how much of this is really going to figure into the into the governments? Exactly. Thank you. Thank you. It is a very good. Uh, someone, I'll come to you later. Uh, can I can I go to this side just to fair? <laughs> okay. There is the gentleman who read. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm coming. <laughs> I think very yes. Okay. Very briefly. Yeah? Thank so, you, Chair. So yeah, I'll be very brief. So everybody will have an opportunity to. Yeah. Actually, what I wanted to state was that what we have seen in South Asia is that whether it's on SAFTA, yeah, but we have we started late, okay. So whether SAFTA or bilateral relations, what we have seen is that sometimes some development takes place, mm. and we are very euphoric about it, and then nothing happens after that. Yeah, it's not implemented. So there there could be different reasons for that. But uh, I have a particular specific question to Praveer, like uh, for example, uh, uh, India decided to you know like provide nepal to the visakhapatnam port for its utilization for its third country trade but nothing has happened so far and we hear different versions if we speak to the nepali private sector the nepali government officials there is one version if we speak to indian government officials there is another version now Praveer is an expert in trade facilities and i think uh, Praveer has looked into this as well so my question to Praveer is what is the real problem behind this okay. and whether that uh, decision that was provided was really fruitful or not Okay, thank you. Uh, well, I know you you uh, you raised your hand. I think yes. it's one from. Please take very briefly. Thank you. Um, actually, I have uh, some queries with uh, um, Salim. Actually, what he stated he stated about the export capacity, for instance, and then there were references by Dr. Mohit about the supply side uh, constraint, which has a link with the export competitiveness. When you were talking, uh, examining export capacity, for instance, whether the complementarity, competitiveness, dimensions that were looked into, which be the kind of, as you referred, the kind of constraints, non-tariff barriers, and other constraints that were uh, looked into. Probably from the future exercise and a policy focused point of view, uh, that could be a uh, further basis of investigation and uh, analysis. And uh, then uh, Prabir, probably the kind of, <coughs> you know, established many studies that we have at the same time, very recent study done by World Bank probably uh, on, on uh, trade, uh, trade including energy trade and all that. And that, uh, and uh, Dr. Mahat was again emphasizing on uh, non-tariff, para-tariff, uh, para and other so many constraints that are hindering, especially both in terms of, you know, efficiency in terms of exports as well as imports. In that uh, context, I don't know how uh, that survey was carried out and which very much uh, contradicts with the already established or concluded, uh, you know, uh, concluded uh, conclusions, uh, so to uh, say. And uh, what I reiterate what Dr. Mohat has said, given the, you know, landlocked and so many, uh, you know, internal supply side constraints at the same time binding many, 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 uh, you know, barriers, uh, you know, in terms of trade relations and all that, probably uh, the time has come to, to have some sort of additional fund and other type of incentives to the poor or least developed countries like Nepal uh, so that, uh, you know, uh, trade, uh, export competitiveness or export <coughs> could be uh, in, okay. in yes. house. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'll move to this side to uh, intervention first, but we need to keep the host happy also, Saman, and then you. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, he will not be happy, you know, so he's doing a lot of good. You uh, won't be here. I have, won't be here. Uh, uh, Chairman, I have a couple of questions, but yes. I'll confine only to one, yes, okay. uh, given the time's constraint. Yes. You see, the the business political nexus has to be interpreted with caution because you see on the one hand it can be a, a virtuous circle on the other hand it can be a vicious circle now even if you look at the chambers in south asian countries they are divided 
a chamber representing the interests of small and medium industries, yeah. import substitution industries, export promotion industries, so on, and retail traders, so on and so forth. Yeah. It depends which chamber is powerful enough to capture the political establishment. A moment, a very inward looking, very protectionist uh, group captures the political establishment, you will find many of the reform policies uh, uh, that had been implemented earlier being reversed one by one. And these are the lobbies that keeps the political establishment going. And yeah. these are the lobbies that finances the political establishment yeah. at a time of election. So just that observation. Thank you. Yeah, political economy side. Okay, please. Okay, then we are coming here. <coughs> Thank you. Then, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Uh, first of all, congratulations to all of them that they did a very good job. You have heard uh, former Secretary General of the SARC, yes. and I had the privilege of working with Kan Kishore Bhagawa as his special assistant to prepare a, ro uh, a report on trade, manufacturer, and services, commonly known as TMS. So I've, I'm the author of that report. Okay in 1989 and since then I have been working on this area and I feel very frustrated mm. where we stood in 1989 we still are discussing the same thing I had the privilege to work uh, to work with uh, Farooq Subhan Saab when he was uh, perhaps director general in the M uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs mm. and you were posted in in, in, in in India as a high commissioner also and we worked and we had a meeting in Nepal we were discussing the same thing, and today we are discussing the same thing. Yeah. Very now, consistent. Well, we are very, very consistent. I feel very frustrated, right? I had the privilege of working with Ministry of Finance and dealing with these type of issues sitting on the government side. Right. So I know many inside the things which may uh, you may not be, all the panels may not be knowing this, and I don't want to discuss those things here. But what I want to uh, find out that give me five non-tariff barriers mm. which is hindering India-Pakistan trade, which I take with me and I will discuss with Ministry of Commerce in Pakistan. And you should promise that you will discuss with Ministry of Commerce in India. So I sure. just need five yeah. non-tariff barriers. OK, very good practical suggestion. <laughs> so you know, basically, well, I say someone has a big task to take this uh, you know, recommendations to the policy makers, not only in Sri Lanka, but also the rest of the world, in a way, package in such a way the policy the politicians can read it. Uh, so anyway, we, we all are frustrated about what is happening, but we want to see more progress and, uh, and in South Asia. Sorry um, to keep you waiting. Well, in fact, uh, I hope we will meet again in the seventh uh, <laughs> South Asia Economic Summit. Okay, and then maybe uh, Again, there will be someone will present us with a progress report <laughs> at <laughs> that uh, summit. Uh, <laughs> okay. But uh, I want to make three quick points. One is on, on this question. Uh, we are actually uh, looking very closely at uh, the uh, investment flows arising out of the India-Sri Lanka FTA. And, and I think uh, we are beginning to see uh, some investment flows from India into Bangladesh following the duty-free access uh, which we have got. But we need to develop uh, the uh, infrastructure. We have some constraints, uh, particularly in terms of transport, in terms of uh, customs facilities, uh, warehousing, and also in terms of uh, uh, some uh, issues relating to certification. Uh, I think we will see movement. Uh, there is an issue of uh, political um, uncertainty at the moment, but uh, hopefully we will cross uh, that barrier. Uh, I have a, a, a second point specifically on uh, the issue of standards and certification. Uh, I, you know, people tend to forget that we now have a SARC Center for Standards and Certification. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we have not taken this very seriously uh, in terms of its capacity, in terms of its, uh, uh, you know, so that uh, we are still a long way away from accepting 
common standards and, and a common certification procedure. I think we do need to focus uh, more on this. And, and finally, a brief question to uh, my friend uh, Khalid. Uh, he is one of, uh, he tells me, five million Khalid Mahmouds in Pakistan. Uh, uh, so I hope I have the right Khalid Mahmoud here. Uh, what is happening with MFN? Has it now okay. good, good, finally good question. Uh, good question. Uh, okay. taken off? Uh, or it's still in the process of... I, I okay, I thank you, thank you. Yeah, so... I wish I could say the million dollar question. Yeah, million dollar question. Right? <laughs> yeah, but, but, but I'm going to give 50 seconds at the end, <laughs> so... Okay, Rajan and here, well, so very brief, 50 seconds each. Uh, okay. Uh, I know, know then thank you, three times the plaque was given, no, but still you. we started late, so we have to have, we have... I'm using my display. They have sent for a firecracker. <laughs> <laughs> Next time. Okay, very quickly. No, nobody can show red flag to the chair. Yes, uh, okay. <laughs> uh, thank you, Chair. What I am going to uh, state is what you say, how to look forward yes, or what is the right, yes. uh, way forward. Uh, to be very honest, what I look at SAFTA, and I will concentrate on that, the way it is devised, truly speaking, uh, and the way it has been negotiated, will never enhance your intra-regional trade. Uh, pick up the way uh, Nisha did an analysis. What is the objective of an FTA? Is to integrate the region. Now the items on which you are uncompetitive, if you are keeping them into the sensitive list because your industry needs a protection, mm. then where are you going to create efficiency within the region? Mm. If you are not going to create efficiency within the region, how are you going to compete globally? And that brings the challenge of how you become a regional supply chain, which we have discussed and Nagesh has rightly pointed out. The second problem in SAFTA is, uh, it is uh, structurally determined that it doesn't allow you for a regional integration if you look at the accumulation provision of the rules of origin. The normal rules of origin is 40%, 35% for uh, Sri Lanka and 30% for LDCs. But for the regional accumulation, the value addition is 50% with a 20% minimum value addition coming in a particular country. Mm. Now, this is a hindrance because you do not have something which is produced as South Asia. So it's still when you are looking into a regional integration, you are looking into one country or another country, and there is a need which, are, which is required to be done into looking into other countries, other FTAs, the one which we discuss uh, very successfully is uh, um, uh, Asia, uh, ASEAN. They do not have these single country obligations. It's a 40% value addition, you do 1%, whatever it is, the minimal, this thing, and you, and that is how you will progressively make the supply chain happen within the region. So these two impacts, the where, Investment could have come where goods could have come, where technology could have come. I am inefficient. I am putting it protected, so nothing will happen and no supply chain. Okay. The third uh, 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 issue, which is uh, on the non-tariff barrier, which has been touched upon. We do talk a lot on non-tariff barrier, what is actually required to be done. Uh, except for Bhutan and Afghanistan, they are WTO member countries. All the SARC members are WTO members. They cannot maintain a single non-tariff barrier, which is not WTO consistent. If it is inconsistent, the first is EU or US, which will take the country to the dispute in the WTO irrespective of like whether it is an LDC or a developing country. What we are missing the point is, once we have identified and what has been said, if you identify this is an NTB which is hindering my export, then how do you enhance your capacity in a country to meet those standards? There are only two ways. Either you challenge that, that this is bad, get it quashed, or appropriately you come to that level by which you, you reach. Okay. Uh, Sarso is there, yes. but uh, uh, anyhow, Chair, thank, thank you, you for thank your you effort. Right. Okay, very briefly, or maybe the last last question. Uh, Mr. Okay. Chairman, uh, you m uh, mentioned about a few excellent points. I'll just mention one. Yes, please. Uh, the, one of the reasons why uh, we are least integrated in the regional uh, trade is so dismal. Uh, Barbara Ali Saab just mentioned that apart from India and Pakistan, there are obvious reasons. Other countries should have at least gone beyond that, but that's not happening because uh, Three of our countries are landlocked, four are least developed. Uh, and uh, we have not done enough, actually. In the SAPTA framework, uh, at least uh, for the LDCs, there is the preferential treatment or a sensitive, fewer sensitive list, longer uh, period of reducing tariff. But the, uh, <laughs> the only provision that we have in SAPTA for the landlocked countries is the it recognizes transit uh, facilitation as trade, trade facilitation, which probably briefly mentioned. Uh, but there, why can't we have a regional transit agreement uh, which uh, kind of harmonizes our transit, transit policies, reduces the number of documents that is required, uh, and also recognizes uh, our 
vehicles, uh, their number driving licenses, number plates, etc. So it makes our lives easier. And a little bit, for obvious reason, the constraints Dr. Mahath mentioned, it will be reduced there. Very good. Uh, these are some very practical uh, actions. I, I, I hope I have not overlooked anybody, right? Anybody? No, I can't see anybody overlook. So, so. Very democratic. <laughs> very democratic. So, I, with your permission, with your tolerance, I want to give at least 50 seconds to our panelists. I think it is fair. Well deserved. Yeah, well deserved. They, they have given a lot to us. And uh, what I want to uh, hear from you is just one thing to add to that list which came from the, from the, from the floor, something we can do to way forward and a practical action. Who wants to start? Right. Yes, Otherwise sorry. we have a food facilitation yeah. right here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but <laughs> I hope you had a good breakfast and uh, tea, so. <laughs> okay, quickly. Yes. Uh, oh, this is not talking? Thank you. I, I think uh, nobody will disagree with uh, Dr. Nagesh Kumar when he mentioned about those SPS and other related. I think these are, uh, of course, they're valid, and it's also being supported by Dr. Uh, Rajan Ratna. But the issue is probably we all know that when, whether they turn into non-tariff barriers. Mm -hmm. so the whole idea, I think one of the suggestions could be uh, whether we can identify priority products and then see and monitor actually what is happening to them. And my understanding is that whether the non-tariff measures, they don't, they don't turn into no trade mindset. So I hope you know, this will not happen. Okay, from here. Oh, the, the mic not, doesn't yeah, work? I think it's uh, working. Yeah, it's working. Basically, two things uh, Farooq Subhan Sab said about the MFN. I think we were very close to the MF uh, uh, status. Uh, but a 25-year period. Uh, no, I would say that uh, 2011 and 2012, uh, these were very groundbreaking years between Pakistan and India. There was a lot of uh, back, back uh, diplomacy and uh, conversation going on at the commerce level. And even uh, the, the government of Pakistan announced that by the end of probably 2011 or 12, they'll be announcing that MFN trouble is that uh, in Pakistan, India, uh, there is a, a huge uh, various kind of uh, power lobbies or power structures in politics, out of politics, and they can create a lot of nuisance value and they can, they can actually influence uh, a lot of uh, normal processes also. Just give you the example that now that new government is here, uh, Nawaz Sharif PM, he expressed his desire that they would like to take uh, the India-Pakistan trade relations forward. And uh, he had to face a lot of criticism from the inside the country also. But somehow, something happened in the letter of, uh, line of control, and uh, then the whole process was rolled back and stalled. And we see during the last 25, 30 years that whenever there is substantive uh, progress inside, something happens uh, from either side, from either side. Uh, you can never actually estimate who triggered the first. Uh, but then the whole process is uh, stalled. But I think with the passage of time, uh, if uh, uh, after the election in the uh, India side also and Pakistan side also, I think we are very close to that, okay. uh, having this MFN status for each other. Okay. Thank you. Then Thank uh, you. one more point, uh, uh, Dr. Saman very rightly said that the nexus between the politics and the businesses uh, always has two shares. Right. So I was talking about the positive shares. Yeah. Thank okay. You. Thank you. Thank you. I don't have it. Oh, that's I just think. Okay. Uh, Nisha. Yes. Okay. Uh, just three things. Uh, India should reduce tariffs to zero because we already have zero tariffs on all the other countries except for Pakistan. Secondly, we should reduce the sensitive list vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan okay. uh, from 614 to 100 without any textile items in it. And thirdly, if we take out one notification which says land port should be treated the same as the seaport, everything will disappear. Uh -huh. And one notification, that's all. That's, thank you, thank you. Very good. Okay. Uh, two, 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 two small comments. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Dhar mentioned the need for studying potential. It's again. How does it help? <laughs> no, it's there. But uh, it also helps us to prioritize our, you know, in terms of facilitation and all that. When you know that, after all, you have to spend a lot of money on infrastructure. Will it pay for itself or not? That's a big question that it answers, that it will pay for itself. The other one is the additional duty, I think, under we have been removing it uh, with Nepal. Um, and uh, uh, as far as the mutual recognition is concerned, that is also inbuilt in the treaty amended in 1979, where we have decided to accept the standards, Nepal. But the capacity building is taking place. 
So, bilaterally, some measures are on okay. on that front. Thank you. Prabhi, okay. you have any? Yeah. Uh, answering to uh, <laughs> Professor Babur Ali, uh, yes, it, it, it would be you know, useful to uh, look at uh, what is ASEAN is doing, their custom procedures. That could be a future research agenda of the, uh, the summit. And then, uh, what uh, Pushpa said, you know, in, in India, if you ask for one, you won't get, or you get a half or a quarter. You have to ask ten. Then <laughs> they will give you one. <laughs> so you don't ask for Isaac. What is it? I need a ten, fifteen ports, <laughs> and you have to get things done by yourself. Phone, a lot of back channel, you know, private sectors to be involved. And to your question, sir, uh, five suggestions, uh, NTVs. And I, Nisha, Professor Neem, uh, add on it. So for me, it should be five NTVs that you ask between India and Pakistan. Number of wagons. <coughs> when number of railway wagons, the government fixed that wagons should be uh, fixed in number so that you don't carry goods. This is, can be removed. Then port restriction. This can be removed by notification by some uh, section officer. And then opening a better of credit between the banks. It can be you know enhanced. Uh, presently, it is not there because banks from each other countries are relying on foreign banks. Third would be the standards <coughs> which are uh, the countries are facing their products. For example, uh, cement from Pakistan coming to this side. Finally, is the banking and finance. So these are the five, you know, the quick okay. uh, banking and finance points. Okay. The five quick NTVs that uh, I, I, I think. Okay. And so last to the gentleman from Nepal, uh, very right, regional transit transport agreement. To add on it, there is an uh, agreement between the sub-region that is moving on. But it's slow. It has to be explained. So, so Secretary person is not there. So it, it could have been, you know, like. <laughs> OK. Thank you. I, I think as the chair of this session, I'm so happy because uh, we, were, we got so many actions and uh, points, basically, to move the uh, region forward. I hope our I IPS staff there, and then someone is not there, but anyway, they, they will let uh, someone know that we will try to get this action point into the program so that and pass on to the governments. And this is very, very important issue that we discuss. This is the main thing uh, to take the process forward. And uh, I think the, uh, the, our panelists deserve a uh, good appreciation. Let's do our hand. <laughs>